Hello everyone, Loremaster of Sotek here, back with another green skin Q&A. I apologize for the last two days, some things have just been a little busy around here. But, to make up for it, we will be doing episodes on Saturday and Sunday, instead of skipping the weekend like the original plan. So you'll still get your five days in this week. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop into today's first question, which is from Mr. Piggy, 2028 who asks, how often do orcs fall to the worship of the dark gods? And what are the orcs that worship Zincher Slanesh like? So, actually in Warhammer Fantasy, at least, Greenskins never fall to the dark gods. They view the Dark Brothers as these really overly complex forces, and they the Greenskins only really see them as mighty foes to try and crump, like just to beat the tar out of. And when it comes to religion and Warhammer, Greenskins probably have the easiest time. Like, they don't have challenges of faith. You know, they are born with an innate connection and understanding to Gork and Mork, and it's just present through their entire lives. So, Greenskins may have been tempted by the Dark Gods at some point. Maybe there are some individuals who have wandered far enough north where that has happened. But there has never been a recorded instance of a green skin who has sided with the Dark Gods. Even though Korn maybe would... Like, Korn would probably be most entertained by orcs, and Zinch would probably be the most entertained by goblins. At the end of the day, the green skins don't really have anything to offer the Dark Gods because they don't have souls that they're willing to barter. And because of that, the Dark Gods aren't really impressed by greenskins and vice versa the greenskins literally just look at chaos as something that they want to get their hands on so they can beat the crap out of it and that even goes for the gods for some overly ambitious greenskins next question is from sigurd meffert who asks i have a question have the greenskins ever been united under a single banner slash leader if so what was the effect this had on the other races so, technically, no, they've never been united under a single banner, but there have been two very close calls. Um, and they both nearly resulted in the Greenskins literally taking over the entire planet, or at least a notable chunk of it. The first was when the Black Orcs rebelled against the Chaos Dwarves a really long time ago, um, like a, at least a few hundred years before Sigmar was born. And when they, when they revolted, they nearly won against the Chaos Dwarves. But luckily for the Dawizar, the Hobgoblins decided to backstab all their Greenskin brethren and allowed the Chaos Dwarves to win, and, the green and they pushed all the Greenskins out. But, as a result, that unleashed the Black Orcs upon the wider world. And a massive horde of them along with all the Greenskins, other, other Greenskin slaves they knew, and all the Greenskins they picked up along the way, started heading west across the Darklands and just kept building up bigger and bigger and bigger into a huge wah until they hit the Badlands. And there, they evolved into the largest, one of the largest wahs ever seen in the history of Warhammer Fantasy. And it seems to have been led by a black orc named Urgluck Blugfang. And he, this army was so massive that you would have to be standing at a absurd height and be looking down on a flat plane to be able to see the entire thing. I mean, it was, it was an army that was so big that if it had made its way into or through Blackfire Pass, it would have undoubtedly erased the race of man from the face of the planet like no problem probably would have destroyed the dwarves as well however they were defeated barely by the combined forces of sigmar heldenhammer who was the high chieftain of what would become to be known as the empire and high king kurgan ironbeard who was the high king of the dwarves at the time at the first battle of blackfire pass or was it i think i think it's considered the first battle of blackfire pass and the only reason they were able to defeat them is because they, the dwarves and the humans team, like, combined their forces and they funneled the greenskins into 
a part of the pass that was only two miles wide. And because of that, the Greenskins weren't able to bring all their numbers to bear. But even then, it was a absurdly close fight. And it was only one because Sigmar managed to lure Bloodfang down off of, on his wyvern into single combat. And Sigmar managed to kill him. And when he was killed, that kind of broke the Greenskins and most of them scattered. The second instance was during the end times, which is when Grimgor Ironhide finally got off his butt and started actually getting a wah together. Because the thing about Grimgor prior to the end times is that he was rather notorious for not being terribly interested in leading an army. Like Grimgor just wanted to fight and smash things. And when he was wandering around, if he went like two days without a fight, he would start attacking all of his own troops. So Grimgor very notoriously was terrible at getting a wall going just because he would kill everybody around him. So the end times was finally when enough was going on in the world that Grimgor was basically able to find never ending battle and just build up a wall without stopping. And he managed to basically conquer the entire eastern hemisphere of the planet because of that um well everything east of the world's edge mountains and he basically started what is ragnarok which we talked about in a prior video and that was literally the end of the world so yes if if the greenskins unite under a single banner it's basically the apocalypse because that they're just there's too many of them and they're too strong and the, the more of them that gather into one place, the stronger they get. And it's exponential. So it's just a really bad time. Uh, next question comes in from Charlie Matthews, who asks, Can greenskin shamans enchant weapons? Yes, it's not super difficult for them. Um, they use different types of rituals. Or in very special scenarios, if it's a particularly gifted greenskin, they might know... A singular spell or they might know a special site where they can basically channel certain powers or emotions or really primitive consciousness into a weapon but it yeah that's when greenskins do create magic weapons or items almost always it's from a shaman very very rarely is there any other method involved you know maybe there's been a greenskin who has <laughs> it's either they stole it from somebody else and use it for their own purposes or a greenskin shaman made it. That's usually how magic items end up in the greenskin hands. Next up is, uh, I don't know how to say this. I'm going to just try. It's Akshbuhas who asks, do the greenskins possess the ability to create, okay, enchant magic weapons? And yeah, we already answered that. Um, Zoo Devil, are there any notable... Uh, Zoo Devil asks, are there any notable forest goblins, battles, or stories? So, yeah, there's actually quite a few. The the spider god in and of itself, or the feaster from beyond as he's sometimes known, he is a absurd um, individual, or god, deity. And the stories about how the forest goblins met him, it, were pretty bizarre. Because basically what happened was... A bunch of goblins started moving out into the dark, deep forests around the Middle Mountains and the Empire. And when they did, they started encountering spiders. And at first, the relationship between the two species was not great. You know, they were constantly hunting and eating each other. But some of the goblin shamans, for whatever reason, started experimenting a lot with the venom of the various spiders. So they would, like, purposefully like find poisonous creatures to eat or would force certain kinds of spiders to bite them either their tongues or uh, parts of their body to basically give themselves these horrible hallucinations and when they did that they met through some bizarre combination of uh, different venoms they managed to essentially achieve this weird I don't want to call them nirvana, but they achieved like this higher plane of idealism where they were able to basically perceive the spider god and make contact with it. 
and they had a dialogue with it to the extent that the forest goblins decided that the spider god should be worshipped as their primary deity. They do still worship Gork and Mork, but they view the spider god as their primary god. And that even leads into the story of how they got the Arachnoroks to start working with them. Because the regular, uh, like the giant spiders and the gigantic spiders, which gigantic spiders uh, are exclusively mounts for particularly strong goblins, like a goblin war forest goblin war boss or a forest goblin big boss. And gigantic spiders are spiders that are like the size of trolls. But those are usually, those are all spiders that they usually like get the eggs, like the clutches of them and raise them. You know, they hand rear them to use as mounts. Arachnoroks are different. Those have to be basically, those have to be convinced <laughs> to join the Greenskins. And the forest goblins figured out that if a shaman basically allow i forget it's like called the purple it's like called the purple venom back or something like that but it's a really special small spider that if the venom is um injected into the shaman's tongue which causes his tongue to swell up really bad um he'll do this really bizarre seizure kind of dance it's more of a seizure than a dance but basically when he does it it the movements his body makes essentially entrances the arachnorok spiders and like they focus in on it kind of like a snake you know with a, a snake piper and um by doing that they the forest goblins figured out they could very basically communicate with the arachnoroks it was very simple dialogue but they were able to recruit the arachnoroks and the Arachnoroks view the forest goblins as either part of their brood or as, you know, menial workers slash worshippers. And so they, a symbiotic relationship formed between them. So that's the crazy thing about them. As far as battles go, the biggest battles for the forest goblins are... During the Black Plague Crisis, when the Skaven, unle when the Skaven of Clan Pestilence released this horrible disease known as, known as the Black Plague in the Empire, it devastated the population. Like, it nearly wiped the Empire out. And there were four really, really big factions um, that were participating in that war. And it was the Skaven of Clan Pestilence, the Men of the Empire, who ended up being led by... Uh, Mandrid Skaven Slayer from Mindenheim. And then the last two were uh, Van Hal, the legendary necromancer, who was, he was an insanely powerful necromancer. But the fourth faction that a lot of people don't know about were the Forest Goblins of the Black Pit. The, the Forest Goblin tribes from the Black Pit actually took a massive advantage of the fact that the Empire's population got scythed down and they basically started spreading out to reclaim all their forest territory, which actually took them into a massive conflict with the uh, um, Skaven instead of... Because most of the Empire towns had either been enslaved, devoured, or just run down by the time the forest goblins realized what was going on and got involved. So for about 35 years, the forest goblins just ran rampant and... Um, they basically wiped out all of the human settlements, most of which were occupied and controlled by the Skaven at that point. They just wiped all of them out that was anywhere close to their sacred site, the Black Pit, which is, of course, located in the Drakwald. So that was a major victory for the Forest Goblin tribes was when they cleared out a lot of the civilization and the Skaven that were too close to the Black Pit. And then, of course, if you ever want, like, good Forest Goblin stories, you can just look up Snaggla Grobspit, who is the legendary special character for the Forest Goblins. Um, his, he is a highly specialized ambusher because he rides on spiders that are notoriously terrifying because despite their incredible size, they are very, very stealthy. Like, they make almost no sound. And they, uh, it was thanks to him that the town of Glomstadt was completely wiped off the face of the map because his spiders are so dexterous and quiet that it was like a fortified town with like stone walls, a gate, everything, and towers. 
but Snagla led the Death Creepers, which are his personal regiment, which are the regenerating spiders in Total War Warhammer. He led them um, like up all the buildings, and these giant spiders, because you know they're spiders, so they can squeeze into small spaces. They just came in through the windows and started like murdering everybody. So the town watch didn't send up a cry of alarm, and the gates got basically thrown open to the forest goblin tribes. So Snagla's lads were able to help the forest goblins just mow everybody down. Which Snagla himself has a pretty uh, interesting story. He's he's basically a um, he's the last surviving member of his tribe, which I think I want to say his tribe is the Redback tribe, or something like that. But um, Snagla is like him and the Death Creepers are the only surviving members and they are very very vengeful against the men of the Empire they hate the men of the Empire and uh, he's even he's had another famous victory called the Forest Road Massacre um, where an, uh, an Empire convoy got caught unawares and it did not go well for them but um, because he just overran all of their artillery and their... Because, you know, they started fighting the forest goblins and Snaggle just came out of nowhere and just destroyed all their ranged units and their war machines, which left the Empire completely surrounded. Um, and then, uh, as far as the last one I could think of, is that in 2511, which is very briefly after Total War Warhammer canonically begins... The forest goblins wiped out another empire town named Glumhof. And as a warning to anyone who would try and inhabit that close to the Black Pit, they made a giant totem out of all the skulls of the people that they killed in that town. So, there's your forest goblin stories. Uh, next up, we've got Xeno Jester, who asks, Do greenskins have normal access to the winds of magic, or do they just get blessed by Gork and Mork to cast? Uh, we basically already answered this yesterday, but just as a quick reminder, they have normal access to the winds of magic. Um, it's just that the way they comprehend the winds of magic um, and the way they shape it to cast their spells is they... they what they think is the blessing of Gork and Mork is really just them using magic. Um, so that's, that's that whole thing. Next up is Ipom Ipom, who asks, How hard is it for a greenskin army, or any for that matter, to storm a Karak? In general, how hard is it? Uh, oh, okay, so for greenskins or Skaven, and then how, in general. So, for pretty much everybody, it is insanely hard to take down a Dwarven Karak. It usually takes a colossal army just to even threaten one, but to actually take one tends to be a very long and difficult trial for the attacker. Typically, there has to be some kind of weakness in the hold that can be exploited in order for victory to be attainable, which, luckily for the Greenskins and the Skaven, was provided in mass by the earthquakes that occurred um, at the start of the Goblin Wars. Because, basically, that whole thing was that there was a series of earthquakes caused by the continent shifting notably, and the dwarves, of course, built along all the mountains, which is where the fault lines are, and it, when that happened, basically their entire empire just broke a bit because, you know, you had volcanoes erupting. There were huge earthquakes that caused cracks and uh, seismic uh, activity. So a lot of the underways got cracked or ripped open with huge gouges. A lot of walls fell or had big holes torn in them. Lava came erupting underneath or into some holes, like wiping out entire levels. Um, the holes that were positioned too close to water, some of them flooded. And because of all that, a lot of the dwarf holds had massive weaknesses. Because prior to that, the dwarf holds were, like the actual ones in the mountains, were virtually impregnable. Like even the high elves at the height of their power w never managed to take down an actual full dwarf hold. They wiped out all the hill dwarves, um... But those were a, those were kind of a joke compared to the actual dwarf holds of the World's Edge Mountains. So to, to get into a hold and take it by force is insanely difficult. You have to have siege weaponry to do it or your army has to be so hilariously massive. Like you have to have the dwarves outnumbered, you know, almost 100 to 1. But um, which is happens you know when you have greenskins versus dwarves but uh yeah when it 
even for the Greenskins and the Skaven, who are, of course, specialists um, in it, take storming and taking a Dwarven Kyrak is probably one of the most difficult things you can do. Uh, unless it's right after the Goblin Wars, which is why, right after the Goblin Wars, a just hilarious amount of holds fell. Um, the last notable one being Kyrak Eight Peaks, which had held out for a really long time, but eventually just got worn down. And it's a lot of most of those actually almost yeah all of them were only possible because the holds had been weakened by the um, the big seismic earthquakes and stuff like that. Next up is Hippie Hurdler, who asks, What's the largest collective wah energy ever amassed and expelled at a single time, not including the end times? In theory, could Greenskins ever amass an... Uh, I'm, okay, so he's asking, what's the limit of wah energy? So, the most wah en magic unleashed in a single go outside of the end times... Uh, successfully being the keyword would probably be old black tooth so there was a really nasty goblin shaman old black tooth who he was the one that was responsible i think he was a shaman or a goblin he might have been an orc but he's the one that nearly sunk all of ulthuan um which would have also resulted in the end of the world more than likely um he didn't have a large army behind him but he had been augmented to an absurd degree because there was a big storm of magic going thanks to the machinations of Grom the Paunch because he was in Grom's army. Um, uh, at the shaman's request, um, they had ended up at Ulthuan. And when they arrived on Ulthuan, most of Grom's fleet had been destroyed by like storms and an empire navy. But enough of his army survived that it was still freaking colossal and when it arrived on Ulthuan, black tooth was the one who convinced grom to go out of his way to start tearing down waystones which basically just started unleashing all sorts of eldritch insanity on Ulthuan. and black tooth started using it to basically um just just destroy the island like he got to tor Yervisi, which has a waystone and a really important one at that. And he was basically conjuring up a big storm to just spike Ulthalon really, really hard. Which would have had unbelievable ramifications. Which in the original story, um, in the very, very original story of Grom versus Eltharion, they tell it as Blacktooth starts getting like influenced by the Dark Gods. But in more modern retellings of the story, it tends to be more that Grom or Blacktooth just is like way high on his own power and just is like gonna pull off the biggest magic show ever for Gork and Mork and just wants to basically manifest both of them <laughs> to just punch Ulthuan into oblivion but uh thankfully for everyone in the Warhammer world old Blacktooth died before he could cast that spell um uh, because Eltharion the Grim just dived out of nowhere and cut his head off um as for when looking at sheer volumes of Wah energy being conjured into a, like, notable purpose, the the greatest use of Wah energy or uh, magic that we've ever seen is used to create these colossal golems known as the Great Idols of Gork and possibly Mork. And or, I should say possibly Mork. So, they're, for shorthand, they're called Idols of Gork. But there are two kinds, or uh, maybe three kinds. But there are different, uh, there are different sizes of idols depending on basically how much magic was used to create them. The more magic is put into it, the bigger they are. So the the biggest, like over the top ones, I think are the, excuse me, the great idols of Gork, and these things are huge. Like they are massive, and they can easily go toe to toe with a dread saurian or an emperor dragon or like the strongest of greater demons like these things are huge they're ridiculously tough and they hit really freaking hard um thankfully there are very very few of them in existence and they require hysterical amounts of magic to function so unless there is like a big storm of magic powering them generally they're not going to be moving 
Um, and like once they run out of magic, usually they fall apart because of their colossal size. But those are those are the absolute worst case scenario. If you're like if you're dealing with green skins that are a hundred percent juiced up, that's what they're gonna build and throw at you, and you're gonna lose. <laughs> um, as for uh, uh, limits, pretty much uh, that's pretty much the height of what green skins can accomplish. Because if you get any more than that, green skins green skins have a bad tendency to absorb way too much energy, way more than they can use reliably. And when that happens, their heads always pop. <laughs> they like explode in a huge, spectacular, overt miscast. And it will usually kill people around them too. Um, and uh, they usually, the funny thing is they almost always know it's coming too. Like they, their ears pop really loud and they're just like, uh-oh. And then their heads explode. So there you go. Uh, next up is from the Bowmaster. Who asked, is there many greenskins in the Darklands? And if so, are they different, if at all? Uh, yeah, there's a ton of greenskins in the Darklands. Just because they're really hardy and are able to survive really well out there. Because it's basically, it's kind of like the Badlands. It's just a lot hotter uh, most of the time. And it has a lot of, because of what the Chaos Doors have done out there. It's a, it's a wasteland that has many, many pools of like toxic sludge and magma pits and it's just really ugly um and the predators in the dark lands are much nastier than the ones in the badlands but that being said greenskins and beastmen are the largest racial demographics in the dark lands um as for the greenskins of the dark lands they're virtually the same as the greenskins of the badlands they're just um the largest percentages are black orcs make up the a massive amount of the darklands greenskins and wolf riders so for goblins m almost all the darklands are going to be wolf riders and for orcs they're mostly going to be black orcs just because that they're kind of just the dominant species there because you have the wolf lands which make up a northeastern part of the darklands and of course the black orcs originate from the Darklands, and their spores are super duper dominant out there. All right, and for today's last question is a mini mini multi question, but let's go ahead and knock it out. The Soviet Gator asks I've seen it stated several times that green skin magic is unique and that it calls upon Gork or Mork, and they actually answer and stomp some fools with foot of Gork and stuff like that. What, make, what makes the green skin gods different from other pantheons in the Warhammer world? And why can't other gods like Moore for humans and Cain for the elves directly intervene in a similar manner? That's okay. So let's answer that first. So many, almost all of the gods do directly intervene when called upon through prayer or the winds of magic, depending on the race. Cain, for instance, unleashes his malign influence through the cauldrons of blood. You know, he allows them to move on their own and it's his will that powers their magics that the um, death hags are able to unleash meanwhile more can be called down by his priests to strike down the undead like easily or put someone to permanent rest many death wizards of the empire are fervent worshipers of more uh, which is actually unique for their order in that they're very religious unlike most of the other uh, orders of the colleges of magic and their magic has a lot to do with Morite, like using their prayers of more to influence how their spells manifest. So it, it's not that Gork and Mork are stronger or have some unique relationship with the world. It's just that the way Greenskins choose to manifest their magic is particularly flashy due to the way they cast it. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like how... Uh, it's almost like how a. Uh, it's just that when you, when you're unleashing spells, the when you unleash it, speaking the language of magic, there's a lot of really important diction, and you have to have a very acute understanding of exactly what you're unleashing, because you have to be able to power the spell that you're casting without losing control of it and it blowing up in your face. So most wizards tend to be very conservative. With the way their magic manifests, that way they don't lose control of it and it explodes in their face. You know, casting a fireball is very simple and straightforward. Greenskins just tend to go a little overboard 
and they don't really care about the consequences which is why their magic tends to be more explosive but they also tend to have a much higher chance of blowing up themselves because instead of being like oh i'm gonna make fire rain from the sky or i'm gonna summon a flaming tornado or i'm going to you know make shadows claw these guys and slow them down i'm gonna summon a giant freaking godfoot and just stomp on people <laughs> you know it's a little over the top so hopefully it answers that first part second question is how is black orc armor made is it scavenged and refined to have an orcish look or are some pieces actually forged uh technically both so uh black orcs armor is most of the time looted from corpses um of especially races that are fond of heavy armor so like the empire chaos dwarves dwarves um some ogre units stuff like that and uh, warriors of chaos and what they'll do is they'll rip off all the plate and basically just hold it to their body and another green skin will take a hammer and just hit it until it's basically bent around them in their shape and it's just kind of permanently a part of them um like black orcs never take off their armor um at beyond a certain point so uh that that's usually how it works but there are orcs and goblins um who have learned the art of forge craft or smithing and they're able to work a they're able to work iron but it's a really crude and a heavy form of iron because it it has just you know it's not very refined and so they're able to basically make black or black orc suits of armor fairly reliably as long as they have the materials which a lot of them do because you know iron rock which is of course a massive um wealth of iron is a green skin dominated location but um because besides that the most complicated things most green skins can work is like bone and wood so um that's where green black orcs almost always will get their materials from some kind of orc smith um, but many of them will just loot stuff and beat it onto their bodies. Uh, next, he asks, how, do, how does the Forest Goblin religion work, and is it sep separate from worshipping Gork or Mork? My understanding is that they worship some kind of spider god. So, uh, we basically kind of answered that. The, the spider god, or the feaster from beyond, is a very different entity from Gork and Mork. Totally separate creatures. Um... You can think of the spider god. The spider god is much more of an eldritch horror. Like, it's it's very Lovecraftian in that it's very cold and alien. And its methods and desires are not very well understood. But, that being said, um, Gork and Mork are still worshipped in Forest Goblin tribes. It's just that the spider god is the preem is is the big boss god and gork and mork are directly below him um other than that we've talked about um all the earlier stuff and uh, as for how their religion works they basically uh they deify the arachnoroks so they they worship the arachnoroks as the living vessels of the spider god the biggest arachnorok is the most important and they will like bring it life sacrifices and make sure it doesn't have to move most of the time um, but, you know, if things get really nasty or they're being under attacked, that's the Arachnorok that when it wakes up is going to stir the Forest Goblins into a frenzy. Like, if you wake up the big Arachnorok, you done screwed up, lad. Like, you do not want to wake that one up. Um, just because it will, the Forest Goblins will go nuts, um, if you do that. But, um, and the last question he has on here is, why is Skarsnik's hat so damn pointy? Is it to poke out Belagar's eye? Sorry for all the questions I love. Appreciate it, man. Um, so, <laughs> the, the the reason that Skarsnik has such a ridiculous hat is because when you're a knight, when you're a war boss, but especially a night goblin war boss, the most important thing to demonstrating your authority is your boss hat. Um, because if you have the biggest and most impressive boss hat, that's what makes you the boss. You know, the Clearly, you know, that's like one plus one equals two. The bigger the boss hat, the bigger of a boss you are. Um, that's why Skarsnik has the most glorious and pointy hat. If you're wondering about the orc counterpart, there actually are green skin, uh, there are orc pirates who have captains, K-A-P-T-A-I-N-S, uh, and orc pirate captains are also very notorious 
for valuing a proper boss hat. Um, though their boss hats tend to be much larger with like all sorts of goofy ornaments like gold and feathers and bones as opposed to the Night Goblin hats which are explicitly just tall to make them look bigger and badder. Um, you know, Scar, Scar Snake's not that big compared to a lot of orcs, so he kind of relies on that big old spiky bot, boss hat to make him look more intimidating. Though he does have Gobla, you know, for the muscle. But he likes to himself come off as very tall. But, um, yeah, so we're out of time. Thank you all for watching. I will see you guys, uh, hopefully today for some live streams. And if not, I'll see you tomorrow for your next Q&A video. Thanks for watching, guys.